Okay, I've got the signal. I'm, I'm good to go. I'd like to welcome everyone to session two. Um, our host today, or I'm going to um, introduce you to our moderator, who's Brett Hodes, who you had the pleasure of meeting on the main stage. And he is our senior manager, a senior program manager at Tech Nation. So uh, he will lead the discussion. And I'm just going to play the video if I can do that successfully. <laughs> Perfect, so I think we're ready to get started. I'll just get another nod from the, the panel to make sure everyone can hear me, good stuff. Okay, excellent. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the second session for today, uh, LMI for you and me. Uh, our goal with this session today, I think is, is really to sort of, I hope, demystify labor market informatics, um, help identify their purpose a little bit, and hopefully offer you some resources as well that you can kind of take off uh, away with you. I know Tech Nation has been really involved in this space lately and uh, excited to share a little bit about that with you. So I, I think that probably the best way to, to begin is by just going around the panel for, for introductions. And I'm just gonna ask each panelist maybe to tell us a little bit about themselves and how they became involved or interested with uh, LMI or labor market informatics and or um, or what they're what they're up to in that space or something kind of interesting that's happening in that space. So why don't we hear from Serge first? Thanks, Brett. Um, really appreciate uh, uh, being on the panel today. So really excited to be talking about the subject. So great to meet everyone. My name is uh, Serge Bukrov. I'm the uh, chief product officer at Skyhive Technologies. We're a Vancouver based uh, Canadian startup that's changing the way that the world looks at labor markets. Uh, by developing artificial intelligence and uh, advanced uh, technologies and platforms that allow organizations to uh, both transform their workforce, but also have an eye toward how the market externally is shifting, how their internal population is shifting, and um, kind of consolidate these these views into robust end-to-end -end, uh, reskilling plans. Um, so some recent kind of exciting work that I've been doing a lot around the LMI space is uh, heading up our, uh, our LMI product, uh, which is a, a solution that's designed for the analysis of that external market, which uh, I've also been leveraging in uh, doing some joint research with uh, leading institutions like the World Economic Forum, uh, as well as Harvard University on the changing nature of, uh, of work and the skill shifts that we're seeing uh, with the World Economic Forum that is around the retail sector specifically, and the work with Harvard is around uh, the impacts on um, uh, on individuals based on uh, different uh, levels of education characteristics and seeing how the post-pandemic shifts are impacting different different uh, populations differently. Sorry, Brett, you're on mute there. Andy, why don't you go ahead? <laughs> I'll take this opportunity to go ahead. Excellent. Uh, yeah, my name is Randy Purse. Uh, I, uh, I come from a long line of various and diverse jobs, and so I've got a bunch of experience in different things. But uh, that was due to my 36 years in the military and public service, where I was primarily, uh, first I was in the Navy, then I was in training development, and then I was in uh, I started moving towards cybersecurity and uh, IT tech training and education towards the latter end of my career. Uh, so that the last 20 years or so, I've been engaged in IT education and training and also cybersecurity. I've, I've been running parallel tracks in that area, and I was really beneficial. It was really beneficial to uh, gain a foothold in this and leverage both my uh, both my disciplines when I got to uh, Tech Nation uh, as a uh, cybersecurity. Um, the director of cybersecurity standards, and I was working with the project there. And then I moved into the VP of Future Workforce Development, where I had a lot to do with uh, a, a multiple projects pertaining to 
uh, workforce development, labor market uh, in information and, and intelligence, and working uh, actually with SkyHive on the development of a platform called Curve Finder. And uh, I was I was I was not even I I was uh, overseeing some of this, but I was not a, a hard worker in that space. Uh, but I have several colleagues who were. But I do find incredible meaning around uh, the 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 information that comes out from there. And I think what I'm seeing now. Uh, and I, I stepped down from the VP role to become more of a workforce development consultant for, for Tech Nation for personal reasons. Uh, and I'm now working also with the Roger Cybersecurity Catalyst as a senior cybersecurity advisor. Again, going back to sort of my, my first love. Um, so I'm really happy to hear talk about LMI and what it means. And what I see from this is tremendous amount of potential to find better fits for more people around what they are able and capable to do and what they have the potential to do uh, without riding so heavily on, on credentials. So I'm really excited about that specific area. And we've been working at that uh, within Tech Nation. And then we're also doing some work in the Roger Cybersecure Catalyst to develop cybersecurity uh, talent in the same way. So I'm looking forward to this discussion. Excellent. I think you should be able to hear me now. I think we've got that all sorted out. Yeah, thanks for keeping that moving. Randy, yeah, and we, we certainly do miss you over here at Tech Nation. And just to back up a little bit further, Serge, I was trying to, to trying to say, you know, based on you know, your connection to LMI, it really seems like you've illustrated this sort of big global effort, like everyone all over the place is trying to figure this out and try and make it readily and accessible uh, to to, to uh, stakeholders across the board so thanks for sharing that and uh, we'll patch it over to Steve but um, you know Steve I also just sort of wanted to say too you know I think most people can sort of deduce what, what labor market intelligence or, or information might mean or what it might look like and uh, probably a lot of people have, have even had um, interactions with it or have been impacted with by it and, and they might not have even realized it because it is complex, it is tricky, it is dynamic. And as I mentioned earlier, we gotta kind of try and demystify this a little bit. So on top of introducing yourself, Steve, I'm hoping that you kind of explain um, how you explain what you do to like, say your neighbors or relatives when you when you have to keep it kind of simple, as I'm sure you're, you're well versed in doing this by now. So if you could share that as well. Uh, sure, always tough question. Uh, I mean, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm from Cape Breton. Um, growing up, I wanted to be a baseball player. Uh, my mom wanted me to be an accountant. Uh, to her great demise, uh, I ended up being an economist. And so how did I get myself here? Basically, the answer is with little or no help from anybody. Uh, and that, I think, is what we're trying to do at the Labor Market Information Council, where I'm now the executive director, is yeah, trying to provide Canadians right the public good of information so they can navigate those choices, right? What does it look like to become a tax accountant lawyer? Or what do I need to do if I really wanted to become a baseball player? And so we see it in use every day and we've surveyed Canadians, right? And it's something as simple as my uncle is a lawyer and he drives a really nice car. That's labor market information in some form or another, right? And so what we're really trying to do is make that full suite of labor market information, right? Whether it's salary, cost of living, what are the skill requirements of jobs really? Yeah, a public good so that all Canadians can kind of navigate these choices with a little bit more simplicity uh, than what's currently available. Right on, thanks for sharing that. And so that we've kind of, uh, you know, context set and we have a little bit of baseline information, that I'll move into some of the questions that, that I have prepared for you today. And uh, maybe I'll start, start with you, Serge, because I, I think you had, you had mentioned perhaps this group, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, um, or at least uh, there's a statistic that came from one of the reports recently, one of these sort of big, you know, national, international groups. And they reported that 32% of jobs will soon significantly change and 14% uh, of jobs will be completely automated. So, you know, on sort of that first data point, the 32% uh, of jobs that are gonna be changing significantly, 
we're already starting to see a lot of this and some pretty good examples and, and some smaller disruptions as a taste of what is yet to come. And we're kind of, you know, uh, it's been sort of socialized that the big change is coming. So with those disruptions, um, what kind of skills or skills demands do you sort of foresee changing the most? And what kind of data is there to back that up? Yeah, absolutely. And it was great to see that kind of that finding corroborating some of the research that uh, we'd been doing here at Skyhive uh, as well. So we found in some of our in some of our studies that uh, over 50% of roles uh, over the past three years have had a uh, more than 30% skill sh shift in terms of skill set. So definitely we're seeing you know a, a broad spectrum shift in uh, how roles are being approached. And this rate of change is, is only accelerating and only going to accelerate over time based on the uh, based on the trends that we're seeing. We're definitely seeing um, uh, a trend that we're seeing across employers on how they're approaching certain roles is, first of all, there's a trend towards skill inflation, that employers are asking for more and more skills for uh, individual roles, that the average number of skills required for a role is increasing over time. Uh, we also see employers, especially in times of, uh, in times like, like today where, uh, we're one of the common issues that we see both in, in our research and in our work with directly with enterprises is that employers uh, often have difficulty defining exactly the skill sets that they're trying to hire for with these roles, in particular with, because they have a lack of understanding of what the future state of that role might look like. And they want to not only hire for the state of today and the needs of today, but also for the, uh, the needs of tomorrow. As a result, we see them starting to hire more for uh, soft skills around flexibility, uh, adaptability, uh, and, and broader skill sets that will enable continuous on-the-job learning to ensure kind of that continuous future future ready state. That in combination with simply increasing the number and variety of skills that they ask for in postings, we've seen our two ways that employers are trying to uh, address these gaps. But obviously both approaches are really uh, shotgun style uh, approaches to solving for very specific uh, kind of skill needs. Uh, and we see that as you know being a, a symptom of a lack of information being present to employers as to the actual changing nature of the market. Uh, so much more surgical uh, approach is needed for sure. Yeah, and I think that's why we're seeing a, a, such a big sort of uh, resurgence and lots of conversations, certainly a conversation future wave next week centered around specifically what, what I would argue is a, is a direct response to that. Everyone's talking about upskilling and reskilling initiatives now, right? And and it, that's why it's so critical to, um, uh, to coach and maintain our adaptability in the workforce. Did Randy or Steve want to jump in? Sure, I can. Uh, I, I I just want to leap off of Serge's comments about the uh, the skill inflation there. We're seeing it, and what I'm going to do probably throughout here is I'll just set the context from my cybersecurity uh, domain. I understand workforce development in general, but the cybersecurity space is a is a great learning opportunity for us, where we've seen skill inflation. There are there are employers who are asking for the sun, the earth, and the moon at an entry level that isn't isn't acceptable to 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 program uh, graduates right we they, they just aren't accepting program graduates in because gra program graduates don't come with five years of experience and a and a certification uh, that that requires an extensive amount of knowledge and abilities in certain fields and things like this and we're seeing this sort of skill inflation happen because they want more than what they can possibly get out of the talent pool that's basically what's happening. And there's not enough people re-scripting or remapping from existing occupations into cybersecurity that actually come with the, with the requisite technical skills in order to make that an easy process. Um, the same thing with respect to what he was talking about re regarding the, uh, the, 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 the broadening of skills and the, this is, this is huge. And in particular cybersecurity because, because it's a very, it can be, it isn't, but it can be a very technical domain. The, the emphasis is on technical skills. And what you see is people coming out of programs and moving into jobs without those other sort of well-rounded um, uh, skills and competencies that they need to actually develop well within a business community and within an industry. Uh, things like, you know, the, some of the things they're talking about now and what we're seeing a lot from employers, you know, bouncing off a of surge comments is, 
you know, problem solving, self-assessment, critical thinking, communication skills, these types of things are all increasingly in demand because employers want more than just the technical aspects and the technical attributes that a person will bring to the job. And the the one thing I would maybe add for me is you know, this study by OECD, and there were many others done in the past five years, which was really the narrative was, look, the robots are coming. We don't need people anymore, right? And I think what's important in terms of what Serge and Randy have sort of discussed is we're no longer talking so much about that. I mean, there's still a little bit of it there, right? Especially when we think about the pandemic and how firms might be thinking about undertaking labor-saving technologies. But the common thread that I take away from what's happening now and what was emphasized through Randy and Serge's comments is we need people with a diverse skill set that's working alongside with technologies, right? If we're really going to harness this uh, for productivity and firm growth and all those things. And I, th I think that's an important shift from, you know, as little as 15 months ago when we we're worried that technology was going to replace jobs altogether, but it's much more about changing the composition of jobs and how people with the right skill sets can work alongside technology. And we see that in some cases in Germany, you have large investments in robotics, but employment growth alongside that is quite strong. And I think that's an important shift in terms of what we've seen uh, not so long ago, in fact. Yeah, like, yeah. I was, I was just going to say that, that that's going on, and we're seeing the exact same uh, um, um, dynamic play out in the AI ML space. Uh, we're seeing, you know, we want people with technical competence, but they need more than that. And, and why do they need more than that? So they can actually enable effective machine learning and AI, effective de deployment and implementation of technology, safe and secure implementation. So those, uh, that's all bad. Yeah, and this could be in response to the fact that tools uh, and technologies used within certain roles uh, in the market today are in many cases quite short-lived and much more short-lived than, uh, than they were uh, previously. In terms of skills, the, the phasing of skills, we see around 97% of emerging skills related specifically to new tools and technologies coming out, and 93 of those that are phasing out being relating to tools and technologies as opposed to soft skills. So that what that represents is that there's this core of soft, transferable, universal skills that is remaining constant and increasing in demand, while there is this flux of specific uh, tools, technologies, and approaches that are emerging and fluctuating in the, mar in the market around them. That's great. Thanks, guys. And, you know, you heard it here, folks. I mean, uh, there is a lot of, I think, worry when we talk about, you know, have conversations around automation. And, you know, I was kind of suggesting, you know, with 14% of, of jobs that are going to become completely uh, automated, you know, there's probably a lot of people wondering if there's going to be this great labor shortage. But it's really great and, and comforting to hear that the robots aren't quite coming for us yet or we'll at least be able to keep up with them. So maybe I'll just, I'll move into my next question, um, and uh, maybe I can direct this one to, to Steve uh, first, is we often hear about, uh, you know, this notorious sort of skills or, or talent gap in Canada's tech sector. And we mentioned earlier, you know, this stuff is really complicated, it's complex. What exactly makes it complex? Uh, I mean, honestly, the to use maybe a technology metaphor, is we're moving from a binary language, which is one or zero, related to qualifications or credentials, to something much more complex, right? So when you think about the jobs of the past, and certainly when I was making my career decisions, as an economist, what were the requirements? You needed a master's degree or not, one or zero, right? Very simple, also very simple to assess me. Either I have it or I don't. Uh, you know, send your certificate, all those things. I mean, that's completely gone to the wayside. So we're now talking about a new and very complex language, right? Uh, which no longer has anything to do with qualifications and credentials, although they remain like an important part, point uh, of human capital development. But when you think about this new language, it's no longer binary. And so you can talk about uh, oral communication, transferable skills, those things are very difficult to measure. Uh, there's a spectrum, right? Uh, it can vary the level of importance for a specific firm. 
And then how would you measure that at the individual? You have high, you have low, you have medium. So it's no longer kind of a binary place to be. And I think what makes it complex is this dramatic shift from an old, very basic language to something entirely new, complex, very difficult to measure on either the demand or supply side. And I think we're still learning that language from either the individual side, the trainers, the educators, from the employers. And there's, yeah, there's a bit of lost in translation. And so we're, we're speaking a little bit like terrible twos, like oral communication. Yeah, so like who cares, right? What does that mean? Um, I'm sitting at home thinking I need oral communication. How do I action that in a way that's meaningful, right? And how do I demonstrate that to an employer? And how do I use it alongside kind of what Serge mentioned, which is like all these emerging tools and technologies. And so I think we're in the early phases of this new language. And I think that's what makes it extremely complex. We're all talking it, as you said, Brett, you know, everyone is trying to think about this new language, but uh, we're not, we're not there yet. And I think that's what makes it the most difficult. Yeah. And I saw Randy nodding his head. Randy, does that uh, translate pretty exactly to cybersecurity too, or did you have any other thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it, it is uh, complex. And it, for instance, in this, again, in the cybersecurity domain, what became problem is, well, what is cybersecurity? What does it mean? How does it, what, what tools are used? And as Serge identified, tools change like every six months at least, right? We're seeing uh, the implementation of ML, ML and AI into the, into the domain that's changing the tool sets, it's changing the learning requirements, it's changing the job effectively. It's some of the jobs are disappearing in cybersecurity already, and we're only really, what, 20 years into cybersecurity as a, as, a, as a profession, really? So that's the one thing. The other thing is when we talk about tech sector, what do we mean by tech? I mean, a blackboard is tech, right? So <laughs> when we talk about tech sector now, it, there is no... And here's the thing that you got to get your head around is there is no tech sector really, right? Yeah, there's an IT, there's some IP people who work on hardcore IT, but then there's a lot of the tech is in every sector right now. And what does that mean? What kind of tech in what kind of sector? And what does that mean? What's the context for that technology? That is huge in the industry's eyes because that context is far more important than understanding how to implement a tool in a set in a set context. It's the context is really important. And um, you know, I think kind of back to the to the notion of the the new language. Like it's a really it's a multi dimensional problem. Um, you know, you've got and and you've got a lot of a discussion around it. Uh, sometimes that oversimplifies a little bit. I mean, we hear a lot about, you know, we've heard a lot about employers talking about the skill gap from their perspective. And that's all, that's a very common, you know, conversation piece around organizations noticing from their perspective, we're trying to hire for these skills and we're not able to, there's a skill gap. And there is in fact in the market a skill gap. If you look at some skills being demanded that are undersupplied. What's talked about less is that there's, there's an entirely other dimension to that, to that specific problem. For example, that there is a, there's a skill gap on the supply side as well that there are skill sets that individuals in the labor market have that they went to school for, that they uh, paid to acquire, that are completely irrelevant and not in demand in the labor market. And in a recent uh, analysis that we performed on the BC labor market, uh, market-wide, we actually quantified the skill gap on the supply side as being 25% larger than the one that employers are talking about, an issue that you know is, is completely uh, you know, not, not at the forefront. And it's diff and it's a difficult problem because to resolve it, you need really everyone at the table. You need the educators ha working to preemptively develop content, not for the gaps of today, but actually anticipating and predicting the gaps of tomorrow. Because that whole curriculum review and development process, of course, that that takes its own time as well. You need government at the table providing funding and providing uh, in, in information, democratizing this knowledge down to the individual level so that individual uh, worker, workers, learners, and job seekers can incorporate that knowledge in a way that's applicable to them. And then you've got all the dynamics when you bring kind of employers into the picture as well. So we see it as a four-sided marketplace. I mean, if I, if I follow up a little bit too, like Sarah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, because what makes it also complex is in this world of the binary language, I think roles and responsibilities of all of the different actors that you mentioned were kind of clear, right? So the individual and the state had some kind of role and responsibility of going to university or college, right? 
and that was subsidized. And the institutions then had a role of forming and developing credentials for individuals. And then the unwritten rule was employers would kind of take that and mold it and form it and develop human specific capital based on those qualifications and credentials. And now that we're speaking this new language, everyone is like raising their hands, like whose responsibility is this now, skills? Is it really the institutions? Should we be doing it at the individual level? Um, what's the role of employers in developing these skills and addressing this gap that, that some had mentioned? And I think uh, we're missing a little bit of a conversation around what are the roles and responsibilities and how you deliver uh, and educate the world in this new language. And I think that makes it also extremely complex with everyone kind of left wondering whose responsibility is this? Yeah, and you know, on that note, Steve and, and Serge, you're, you're talking about kind of all of these different stakeholders and all everybody having kind of, you know, their own different roles to play in all of this. So how, how are the private and the public and the third sectors working together currently to address some of these gaps? So definitely the, you know, the, the private sector uh, we see as kind of identifying the need often and, and looking kind of anywhere they can to help resolve it. A lot of our, a lot of our client organizations are large enterprise, Fortune 500, Global 2000, multinationals that, you know, look for a solution to this, uh, but uh, don't find a lot on the market and try to do something internally. And often it takes the form of competency mapping exercises. It takes the form of consulting engagement. Uh, and it takes the form of employee level uh, skill surveys around, you know, what do you know? And, uh, you know, what, what, what can you be doing? A lot of these traditional approaches, uh, you know, the problem we see with them is that, like, even even if you look, look at the self-assessment level, you know, if you ask a typical person on the street, what are your skills, they'll be able to give you like a, a Sparknotes version, probably maybe list off two to 10, uh, you know, they'd be hard pressed to look at the wealth of experience that they've acquired and relate all of that to actual skill sets that are transferable and that are in demand in the market. And this is especially true of populations that are more vulnerable that don't traditionally see their employment as being skill oriented or skill based, but that nevertheless definitely does have an impact on their skills. So for example, in, in work that we've done with Aboriginal communities in Canada, looking at non-formal uh, work experience that they've done within their communities, uh, their community experience, their volunteer experience, their caretaking of elders or food preparation, skills that, that they've acquired there that could very well be transferable into the labor market, but that aren't uh, recognized at a traditional level. So even the approach that organizations take to their own kind of internal competency mapping isn't informed by the broader kind of, uh, you know, public sector holistic view of the market as a whole, where, where you know, the enterprise and the, and the business and the private sector is just one component of it. My answer would be it's very patchwork right now because, yeah, it's, it's a new market. Um, I mean, when we think about labor markets as a market, uh, there is now a new market for labor market information. And I think you see different actors, uh, be it Skyhive or Labor Market Information Council, trying to sort of uh, advance the use uh, and application of this new language. And I think for the moment, it's a little bit patchwork, but I think to your earlier point, Brett, that everyone's on the same page, that this is the nut we have to crack, right? Uh, and it's global. And the more we have different actors, public, private, not-for-profit, uh, trying to figure this out, I think the, the better. Yeah, I think there's a, uh, we're, we're really stuck in a bit of a ditch in many ways because we're not, we're having, we're crawling, trying to crawl out of the ditch and we see all this potential uh, and we really not don't know how to get there uh, as a system. And uh, one of the things that I'm really proud of from, from the Tech Nation was the career finder work that we did with Skyhive and, and other stakeholders where we actually saw this continuum of, of potentiality in the, in the labor market uh, analysis and figuring things out, scraping real time data from demand, from employers, to get a good idea of where things are. And it's working quite well in cybersecurity. Yeah, it's MLB based, so it's still learning and such. But we had industry input to define the cybersecurity domain because it was all over the place. And we had those the industry stakeholders do that. We had educators in there to see, okay, yeah, well, this is, 
this is the the differences between get programs and what what we're what's happening in 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 the domain we have uh this this continuum of of uh of understanding across a, a community within the cybersecurity talent alliance that says okay this is what we now think are the challenges and the priorities and let's go there and it and it's not credentials based it's it is becoming skills based it's becoming much more attuned to what the market's asking for and that gives not you know universities and colleges can't turn on a dime but they can be as Serge has indicated anticipatory right they could see how things are going and with this LMI we could actually start to see trends we got to be careful because it's not always right right so but but having industry and it's government funded uh, government guided industry led and and academically rigorous right so we're seeing this and i think it's it's beneficial to finally get into some real time uh, labor market information so we could actually start responding if we didn't have these tools we'd still be lost i really like Stephen's comments uh, or somebody's comments, it was actually it was the other group talking about how we used to be labor market data used to be five years behind the market, right? And now we're getting the opportunity to see it up front, and 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 this is very meaningful for employers and for uh, for pr pr prospective job seekers, and certainly uh, for for the academic and in educators and the trainers out there who could say, okay. Well, let's see where it's going and what could, what do I need to do in order to get somebody up there and get develop them into uh, becoming job ready. And uh, I'll put I'll pitch a, a, a coin in for the will year, the work integrated learning program and co-ops and internships and things like that are a significant benefit to getting bridging some of the gap between what education is providing and what employers are requiring. So it's kind of a neat. We're starting to see some uh, innovative things coming out that are actually going to help uh, bridge these gaps until we get this more global um, um, system figured out. Yeah, and it's going to take some time. It certainly isn't, uh, you know, a, a panacea that's going to come in and sort of answer all of the questions. And uh, I think you're, you know, you're bang on. It, it certainly does have some limitations. And, you know, moreover, in the previous session, uh, Kelly Lenze from uh, Indigenous Works, you're right, was kind of... Uh, bringing up a little bit, uh, a few points on, on LMI. And kind of, I think one of the points that he was trying to make in the previous session was that, you know, we're not necessarily training students to even be career, to, to have a career fit or to, 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 to do, um, to figure out how to best fit in their career. We, so we give them, you know, labor market information or we get to that point where, where it is readily available um, and, and it is deployed and it is in the market and it's accessible and it is real time. And, you know, we'll start to sort of realize these pathways into careers. But how do uh, experts in, in labor market information um, and, and leaders in industry and government make, you know, help out and take it to the next level to make sure that um, you know, after you know, the, the LMI has, uh, has been of use to, to you know, students, upskillers, reskillers, how, how can we ensure that, uh, that the right pathway has been realized and that there is a career fit? Um, maybe if I could take a quick stab. First, I mean, a couple of things for us is I would say what we're trying to do is empower individuals to make informed decisions, right? So for us, at the end of the day, if you decide to become that tax accountant, lawyer, or economist, or try to be a baseball player, um, that's great. Have at it to some extent, right? And uh, there have been... Yeah, I, I think it's a, there's a risk to trying to draw people, I think, at least from our public provision of information of what we're trying to do to certain places. And so for us, it's really, it's most about helping people make informed choices. And I think when I think about this new space and machine learning and AI, for us at LMIC, we're, we're most worried about market segmentation of how labor market information is delivered, right? So ask me if I'm worried about any of the large financial institutions or tech firms, whatever you wanna call them, about how they manage their LMI and recruit internally, I'm not worried at all, right? What I'm worried about is making sure that group of intermediaries, career practitioners across the country 
that are helping more vulnerable Canadians every day make a more informed choice, that they have access to good information, it's reliable, it's transparent, and there aren't significant uh, price or access barriers. And so, yeah, one is definitely what we're about is, is helping people make informed choices, not necessarily pointing them to a particular choice uh, and making sure that there's equitable access to this information and it's not just entirely driven uh, by some large firms. And there, I think we have some, some work to do. Well, you know, hopefully we, we continue down this road to uh, sort of a, a, a skills-based economy and, you know, uh, the employee, the uh, labor market continues to sort of realize the growing value um, of, uh, of uh, agile workers and, and transferable skills. And, and kind of on that note, you know, the Future Skills Council in the same report that I'd mentioned earlier recommended a frame, an actual framework for transferable skills. So on that note, why should employers be especially concerned with understanding the intricacies of transferable skills? And how does that play into uh, an agile workforce? <laughs> That's it's an interesting question because there's a lot of employers don't like the idea of transferable skills as if it takes them out of their organization, right? So, but there are many, many employers and across in, in the tech industry, you'll find it as well, where, you know, they're, they're really interested. If you're looking at uh, functional ability across the organization, being able to remap to new technologies, new processes, et cetera, those transferable skills are key, right? Those things that people will enable people to do more meaningful work or better work within an organization are, are important. And that's what a lot of these transferable skills are. Um, the, I think on the other side, the transferable skills are en enormously important for the Canadian economic well-being. People be able to, and the education or the training to support uh, moving into different contexts relatively readily, right? We're really, our skills gap is has got nothing to do with the individual capability of people. It's a lack of planning and a lack of coordination around getting people and giving them opportunities where they can explore their potential. Uh, that's my view. Um, and, and, and a lot of people, as, as Serge earlier indicated, there's a lot of people that have a lot of tremendous capability, right? But identifying it and recognizing it and then turning that into something that's meaningful and during work is the challenge. Well, I think we, I think we could do that. And in a lot of cases, that is bang on what transferable skills is all about. What did I, what did I learn when? How good am I at it? What does this mean to another employer? And I think that that's an opportunity that we can't miss. Yeah, it's that recognition I mean, component that that Randy you're mentioning, and combined with that democratization of knowledge piece that you know Stephen uh, you were talking about earlier uh, around the opportunities that could exist. That that's the approach that that we've taken with some enterprises where where they are transitioning to a culture of you know, let's show people what, what is available and what exists out there. And doing so, of course, in the context of their own organization and enterprise, and typically, you know, it's a multinational with hundreds of open roles. And uh, But even showing somebody how their skill set within an organization can facilitate mobility and how they can go from their role today down a career path in, in seniority, uh, but also into a completely different area where they may never have re even realized that their skill sets apply but that in fact they do. And you know, even if they're only a 60% match uh, from a skill perspective to, to, this, to this role that really excites them that is in a completely different area. But knowing, knowing that gap and knowing how to close it, that already provides, that is uh, taking some, that is creating a pathway where previously no pathway existed for that individual. I'm going to take the reins. I'm sorry, Randy, just because I have to bring it bring it home in the next few minutes. And I think this next question that I have prepared is is probably one of the the most important questions uh, that will be asked. And and Serge, maybe you can kind of pick up on it. Uh, what role um, has LMI played in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives? And what can we expect in in the future? And and even kind of just a step further. What should we be doing to ensure that labor market intelligence is driven by unbiased representative data? Yeah, that's a great question, Brett. So, you know, the uh, a lot of issues with taking kind of a traditional or a, like a uh, an easy approach to LMI is taking data that's readily accessible, that's easily accessible, and then making conclusions based off that. The data that's easily accessible is not always the data that's most representative 
of all the various diverse communities uh, and uh, and uh, backgrounds and experience sets of individuals. So that's that's an area where we need to be really careful. Where we're making sure that the data that we're that we're using to drive that LMI is fully representative of diverse communities. Uh, there are frameworks that 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 should be applied when working with with that data to make sure, especially when AI or machine learning is involved, to make sure first of all you have. Uh, diverse groups of people working uh, on that data to make sure there's community consultation taking place uh, to make sure that there are uh, ethical standards and, and uh, frameworks applied in terms of eliminating potential sources of bias. So for example, if you're working with job descriptions, uh, scanning through that job description, potentially finding gender biased or uh, otherwise biased language that, an, that might have stuck in there from employers, which we know does happen unfortunately in the market, that needs to be eliminated prior to, to ingesting that. Uh, there's some great standards right now. There's kind of a patchwork internationally uh, of standards for ethical and transparent use of artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, there isn't a unified standard. There's some really exciting work being done right now uh, by the um, uh, uh, by the GPE, uh, the Global Partnership for Artificial Intelligence, which is uh, ratified by the G7. Uh, that I'm giving a bit of a plug for because our our CEO of Sky, Sean Hinton, is is actually on that body, and they're working on a new global standard there. Uh, but I think there, we, we, the, it is really an area that needs to start at the data level and then everything onwards. Awesome. And we got to bring it home. And I want to give each of you guys a minute to just sort of sign off and, and, and leave us with some final thoughts. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Steve, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, thanks. No, look, uh, again, what I would say is um, whatever decision you're making, try to get a handle on as much labor market information as you possibly can and just make sure that even if you choose your passion, which uh, I highly encourage, make sure that you choose it uh, with as much information as possible. So make that choice informed. Awesome, thanks for that. Randy? Yeah, there's lots of, <clears throat> lots of information out there. Filtering is important. So when you're doing this, make sure you're filtering the information uh, that that applies to you, right? So uh, there's a lot of, uh, of potential and and looking for your fit can help. Uh, but you know what? You can start somewhere and end somewhere else. I am not a cybersecurity expert by any stretch of the imagination. Sorry, I'm not a techie, but yet I'm de I'm a defined cybersecurity expert in a particular area. So who would have ever thunk that, right? That I'm here now. So it's it's completely possible to get from one place to another. I think Steve is another example of that. <laughs> so. Started in the ditch and now I'm here. Uh, yeah, just whenever working with uh, with data uh, and, uh, and algorithms that prods it into LMI, really be, you know, be aware of black box algorithms that can't explain what they're taking and how they're working and what the output is really if, if, if a person can't explain how it was done, then likely, then likely there, there are elements that uh, uh, where a bias can creep in and where the results can be skewed. And so just uh, make sure that the information you're working with is really transparent. Great. Well, this was another amazing session. I'm, I could pick your brain all day about this, but we, we've come up to the end of our time and we have another really great uh, panel uh, in the sessions box. I'm, I'm not sure if it's up here or over here, but you can click there and head into the third session. Uh, it's gonna be a really great kind of more, more fireside, I think, uh, style panel uh, uh, moderated by Kara Krasik from Seawell. And uh, she'll be chatting with, uh, with SMEs, talking about sort of their successes and challenges with work integrated learning. So very excited. So I want you guys all to head on over. Steve, Serge, Randy, thank you again so much for being here today and contributing. And uh, we'll keep in touch. Thanks everyone for attending.